Welcome everyone to a webinar entitled Food, Logic, and Creation. Does STEM help form better Catholics? Presented by Father Leo Padalinghug, Dr. Thomas Marlowe, Father Gerald Bonapane, and Father Joseph Laracy. My name is Sebastian Mahud, and I'm the director of iTest. The Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology, iTest, is an association of theologians, scientists, and others committed to a Catholic worldview in which faith and science collaborate in exploring the truth. iTest explores truth theologically in the wisdom traditions of the human community and in the data studied in the sciences. iTest's mission is to foster and disseminate the Catholic position that science and faith in God are complementary paths to human fulfillment. This webinar will focus on signature courses at Seton Hall, where STEM engages the Catholic intellectual tradition. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The Seton Hall University core, taken by all undergraduate students, includes a sequence of three signature courses. These are rooted in questions central to, but not exclusive to, the Catholic intellectual tradition. The third course, Engaging the World, encompasses a set of courses building on the first two from many different academic perspectives. We look at challenges in developing such courses in STEM disciplines, and then at three particular courses, Science and Theology of Food, Logic, The Limits to Knowledge and the Catholic Intellectual Tradition, and Creation and Science which is also taken by students at the Seminary School of Theology. The purpose of these courses is to inform and engage, and not at all to persuade or convert, and their goal to make better and wiser Catholics and everyone more informed and reflective. To begin our webinar, we present a previously recorded presentation by Father Leo Panalinghug. Father Leo is a priest member of a community of consecrated life Voluntas Dei, the will of God. He is the creator and founder of an international food and faith movement called Plating Grace, and founder and chair of the nonprofit group, the Table Foundation. He is a best selling author, acclaimed international speaker, host for radio, podcast, and a weekly international food and faith show on EWTN, Savoring Our Faith. His unique background as a professional chef in his previous experience as a two-time black belt martial arts instructor and former award-winning breakdancer and choreographer has earned the attention of major media outlets, including the Food Network. The mission to see food as a gift from God to nourish your family and to strengthen relationships is making this world a better place, one meal at a time. I now present Father Leo Petalinghug. Hello, everyone. My name is Father Leo Padalinghug, host and founder of an international food and faith, mo faith movement called Plating Grace. It's a movement to bring families back around the dinner table, and it's a pleasure to address you for this opening address for this webinar on food, logic, and creation. And I'd like to begin with a prayer, and it's going to be a prayer that you're all familiar with, and hopefully it's going to make sense as to why I wanted to start this webinar with this prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty, through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Now that might be a little tongue-in-cheek of a prayer, and everyone knows that prayer, it's like Simon says, but the reason why I say it, it's because it is one of those Catholic things that at least in English speaking countries, we all know that we say before we eat something and it's a pause on our day for us to recognize that what we are eating is technically when we pray a sacramental. It's not just food, but when we invite God into that reality, it literally becomes a sacred moment. It's not the sacrament but it is a sacramental in the same way a cross is just a piece of metal until you bless it, it becomes 
a sacramental reminder. There's a holiness attached to it. Can holiness be attached to food? Most definitely. And this is why I'm grateful to have the opportunity to discuss this subtopic of a theology of food, because I've been doing this for so long. I am just a little background. I am a Catholic priest ordained in 1999. So I've been a priest for a while, and the majority of my work has to deal with food. I host the international TV show, Savoring Our Faith on EWTN, have written books about a theology of food, and have traveled literally the world talking about the power of food and how we can change life with what we put into our bodies. But there's always a spiritual connection because even though I am a professionally trained chef, I am, more importantly, a Catholic priest. And before this whole plating grace and before this whole theology of food thing even took place, on my ordination date, I actually had my holy card prepared. And if you're familiar with Catholic priest ordinations, there's usually a quote, a prayer, a scripture verse, or something there that kind of captures in an essence what you're experiencing at that moment before you're ordained. And for me, I chose from John 23, the question that Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And we know the answer. Yes, Lord, I love you. And then Jesus replies that feed my sheep, feed my flock, feed my sheep. And so all of that was perhaps part of God's plan for me to be now known as the cooking priest, which is kind of silly. And it almost sounds trite. But as a Catholic priest, I do have a responsibility not to cook, but to serve. As a pastor, I have to provide for the flock. As a father, I have to provide the daily bread. And as a servant of the Lord, I have not only to be a servant at the table, but as a priest, I also have to be, in a sense, the altar and the sacrifice. In other words, I have to feed people with myself, and I can only give what I have received. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, then, what do we receive? Well, we receive God through food. And so... This kind of started for me when I was actually a seminarian. Before I thought about, you know, food as like a a form of ministry, I was just a seminarian wanting to be a priest. And during one of our retreats, we had to eat in silence. Imagine that, priest having to be silent. But this one particular retreat leader, she was actually a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist. And she worked particularly with mental health issues especially regarding sexual deviancy. Thank God our church takes this seriously enough that they're preparing men to be aware of their hungers and their desires, their sexual appetite. Are you hearing the language so far? I think you do. Well, she was asking us to make sure that we understood what we hunger for, and more importantly, where do we go to be fed? Because if we're hungering for the wrong things, the devil will be very happy to serve it to us. And so she actually gave us this retreat. And during this meal time, we had to eat in silence. And again, that's really difficult for people to do. But she gave us things to consider, to meditate upon, particularly what we were eating. We had to look at the food, imagine the colors. We had to go and understand where it came from. We had to smell it in all of those those thoughts and feelings that come from one of the most powerful senses we have, smell. I think the Psalms should include taste, see, and smell the goodness of the Lord, especially since Holy Father Francis tells us we've got to smell like the sheep. And then she had us taste it and think about all the different flavors and and reflect on where the food came from. And to be honest with you, I got a little bit emotional about it because I realized I was missing my own family. We would eat together pretty regularly. It's a dying art, unfortunately. And so this meal somehow connected me not only to my family, but to the farmers, to the, to the people who processed the food, the delivery drivers, and then even the chefs whose hands were touching it. And then it helped me to realize that next to sexuality, the most intimate thing we can do is feed people. Look at what a mother does for the child and look at what a father has to work for 
to almost in a sense be part of that feeding process. So it just got me thinking that food has got to be more than just what we put in our bodies. And then of course, there was a moment of prayer where we would obviously pray in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And I would just look at that piece of bread, which is no longer just bread, but super substantially, it is the presence of God. And I had to ask myself, if God could present himself to us in any way possible, what would he become? Well, he became food. And it's very much rooted even in our Christmas story. He was born in Bethlehem, which means house of bread in Aramaic. But in Arabic, it means house of meat. So place where people bought bread, place where people brought meat, and he was placed away in a manger. And that word is from the Latin manducare, where the Italians get mangiare, to eat. Think about this, brothers and sisters, and we are brothers and sisters if we share the common meal because we are what we eat. And it gets you deeper into a meditation of this theology of food that I kind of had to start writing about and reflecting upon, not just because I am a priest, but because I have a culinary background. And I discovered that the easiest way to touch people's hearts and minds is to go through their stomachs. And this is obviously a technique that Jesus used to bring about deeper conversion and all of those sinners that he would eat with and serve with himself. And so this idea of the theology of food might sound like we're stealing the idea of a theology of the body. I mean, that's obviously a much more studied um, academic theological discipline. But I always want to tell people that my idea of a theology of food came first, because before God even made the body, God made food. And in the body, God created hunger, desire, appetite. And he gives us, as the providing father, food that we do not have to work for. Adam and Eve were pretty darn lucky, but they were not very smart about it. They were innocent to the point of being naive because only when God said, you know, avoid that one tree, avoid one thing in their naivete, the devil knew that if we are not aware of what we put into our system, then it can really screw up what God created that was originally good. Perhaps this creation account and the fall of our parents is a reminder that we have to be more spiritual sommeliers learning about what we are putting into our system, not just in body, but in mind and in spirit, because God is intentionally trying to save us from all the poison that we have eaten when we have all, and don't lie, we've all eaten of the forbidden fruit. I mean, that's why God gives to us, thank God, a church with confession, where we, before we can participate in a sacred meal, we have to, in a sense, purge ourselves, get rid of all that junk that we have filled our bodies, minds, and souls with. But because we've all eaten of the forbidden fruit, Jesus comes to us as a real savior and gives to us his blessed fruit. This hung from the tree of knowledge in a garden. This hung from the tree of life in the middle of a garbage dump where crucifixions occurred. And it's only the discerning who are going to realize that we are supposed to eat not of the forbidden fruit, but of the blessed fruit that hangs from the tree of life. Mary's product. And we then become more connected, not just with Adam and Eve, but with the new Adam, who was Jesus, and the new Eve, who is Mary, all because of our hunger to become part of God's family. You know, um, in Italy, it's very interesting because I studied some culinary there. It was there that I started to realize that food is much more than something for the body. For Italians and for anyone who takes their food seriously, which is the majority of romance language and, and including even people in the Middle East. My gosh, you have battles over the way people prepare hummus, right? But I, it, I discovered that when people take their faith seriously, they also take their food seriously. I mean, for Italians, 
food is like a contact sport. And it kind of reminds me of this, this uh, quote from G.K. Chesterton. And he talked about how you can't love anything without wanting to fight for it. I mean, have you ever watched Italians watch someone who's not Italian cook Italian food? I mean, they're just like in, in sheer agony and pain because for them, their food is part of who they are. It's amazing that our Catholic faith is rooted in a country that is most visited by every tourist, not just pilgrim, but tourist going there for what reason? To see the churches and to eat their food. It's brilliant how Jesus chose to send Peter on that mission, so to speak, to go out and to start his church in a place that's going to be known for spreading the good news. And so this theology of food, which I think we need to take a little bit more seriously, and I'm so grateful for iTest for being able to add not just simply a pastoral dimension, but even a theological, academic, scholastic dimension into the power of food. Because if we don't think about it, if we don't learn about it, then what we are doing is we're just eating something without having any connection to it. It would almost be like contraceptively eating. Because the whole point of eating is to let it become a part of you, let it affect you, let it change you, let it become incarnate in you. And the one thing that we as Catholics know is that we don't go to church for the homily. I mean, you sh should be a part of it for sure. We don't go to church because of the pretty buildings, although that should be a part of it for sure. We don't go to church because of the amazing music, which again, Catholics were responsible for bringing out beauty and music. All of those things, from the dynamics of the priesthood to the artists who created the architecture and the music and all those sensory things, that's all geared towards that one moment when heaven and earth literally touch, not just on a table, but inside of you in that reception of receiving Holy Communion. This is why when Unfortunately, politicians kind of talk about receiving communion as a right rather than as a gift and therefore responsibility. It's because of our lack of deeply teaching, disciplining, and also creating awareness of the power of the Eucharist. So the theology of the food is not about giving you recipes. It's about giving you a recipe to get to heaven. And so I'm so grateful for the opportunity to address all of this in, 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 in what many people have called my ministry to be as just simply as a cute little priest cooking on TV. And, you know, fine, I'll take whatever compliments you want to give, including backhanded insults that are kind of complimentary. But everywhere I go, people are starting to think, they're starting to understand that maybe food is so powerful that even... Columbia University told people that if you want to reduce drug addiction in teenagers, teen suicide, teen pregnancy, plus improve your teen's testing scores, the number one factor in all of that is a regular family meal. And isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't suggest Sunday as a day of obligation, but also as a day of opportunity so that we as children can be fed at the table. This is why I'm grateful for the study that's being put into this, the conversations being initiated. And I think that every parish and even seminary should start understanding what the power of food is all about. In fact, in, in one of the books that I've written, it's called Epic Food Fight, A Bite-Sized History of Salvation. I'm not promoting anything. I'm just letting you know that, that food is, is a weapon of choice for the divine. The evil one used food to try to destroy us. God will use food, the bread of life, the cup of eternal salvation to save us. And whenever I bring these things up, especially as I'm doing conferences for priests or seminarians or parishioners in general, I always remind people that how you eat and your understanding of the meal is going to be how you approach the Eucharist. It should be both familiar and formal. It should be both an understanding of the humanity of food, but also with the Eucharist, the divinity of food. These are just some thoughts that I wanted to share as you begin 
this seminar on the logic and the creativity that food provides because it is something that can change us for the better or for the worse. You know, being an American with a Filipino and Spanish background, food has become kind of like an eclectic thing for me. And then, of course, studying in Italy and then taking culinary courses around the world, I, I just realized that the most important thing about food is not the technique, but how it makes you feel. I know that feeling is not a word that a lot of people in systematics like to talk about, but relax, relax. I'm not trying to get you to be in touch with your emotion. I'm trying to get us to be in touch with what moves us. And that is food. It, it's what gives us the energy and also the memory and also an opportunity, hopefully, if the food is good, to celebrate and experience the good things that God wants to give to us. So in all of my presentations, whether it be, you know, live or, or even the TV show or the books, I always like to remind people what we hunger for and where we go to be fed, but more importantly, to always stay hungry for God. I love the quote from St. Francis de Sales, who was truly a systematic theologian, but also a very pastoral person. I would want to encourage us that as we approach this in a more scholastic academic way, that we never forget how to put these things into practice. Just eat together for goodness sakes. But St. Francis de Sales would say, we've got to be like the bee who goes to the flower and takes what it needs. It doesn't drain the flower of its nectar and its goodness, but it takes what it needs in order to pollinate and to spread. And that's kind of our job is to take what we're going to get from this seminar make it a part of us, and hopefully share the good news. You know what the good news is? If you are hungry for heaven, God has a meal waiting for you. In fact, one of my favorite quotes is from the book of Revelations, chapter 3, where it talks about how God knocks on the door of your heart. And if you answer and let him in, he will not only come to you, he will have supper with you. What a gift to be a part of this conversation, this webinar, and hopefully uh, this opportunity to be fed body, mind, and soul. The only thing I can say at this point is uh, bon appetit. And also to say, we give you thanks, almighty God, for these and all thy benefits, which we, are, which we have received through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Leo. And now I'm delighted to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Thomas Marlowe. Dr. Marlowe is Professor Emeritus of Mathematics and Computer Science at Seton Hall University, where he taught in both disciplines for over 40 years. He holds a PhD in each discipline from Rutgers University. He has always had an interest in interdisciplinary and integrative studies in both his teaching and his research. He worked with Father Laracy and others over the past seven years to develop an interdisciplinary upper level course for Seton Hall's university core program on logic, the limits to knowledge, and the Catholic intellectual tradition, and consulted with Father Bonapane on his course on science, food, and theology. This work has led to several conference and journal publications. So my presentation is going to have three parts. Those who were here at the beginning heard Dr. Food explain some of this. The first part, namely what the Seton Hall Signature Experience is about. Then I will discuss the difficulties and opportunities for offering such courses in STEM disciplines. That is science, technology, and mathematics. Seton Hall doesn't do engineering. And then I will discuss a little bit about the formation and the content of our logic, limits to knowledge, and Catholic intellectual tradition course. Okay, let me see if I can minimize this. There we go. So the Seton Hall University core, core is taken by all undergraduate students. It consists of some English courses, a course in orienting to the university and three signature courses. 
The three signature courses are deeply rooted in the Catholic intellectual tradition. The first uh, on enduring texts and recent reflections, meaning and purpose of intellectual of human journey. They um, include texts, not just from Catholic philosophers, but also from the secular world and from other religious traditions, including Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, and others. And they have a fourfold growth goal to deepen the student intellectually, to give a conceptual basis, to explore ethics and morality, and to obtain a better understanding of the Catholic intellectual tradition and often Catholic social thought. As Sebastian said, the goal is to have better and wiser and more informed and for all students to have them better informed, more reflective, and more considerate. There is no intent to persuade or convert. The courses may include instruction on Catholic doctrine, but not in Catholic doctrine. Students are required neither to believe nor to support Catholic positions, except, of course, those that have to do with academic integrity and plagiarism. And in general, the dialogue between those who are strong believers and those who are either wondering or in other faith traditions provides for some interesting byplay. The first two courses taken by all students and more or less uniform are the journey of transformation, looking at the Catholic uh, intellectual tradition placed within the world. Christianity and culture in dialogue, looking at other faith traditions as well as the Catholic and Christian tradition in general, Catholic social teaching, and developing a personal worldview from those traditions. Those are taken in the first two years. They generally have oral and written engagement or interaction with readings, many from the Catholic intellectual tradition, and require a final artifact, typically a term paper, though others, instructors, have done different things, including videos or blogs. The third course, nominal course, is Engaging the World. It's actually a set of courses building on and elaborating the first two. It's the interaction of the Catholic intellectual tradition with academic disciplines, typically taken in junior or occasionally senior year. Reading a core three course and engaging the world course is often easy. If you're in the humanities, there are lots of opportunities in English or in history or in the languages for looking at Catholic authors, for dealing with Catholic themes in literature, even in literature written by non Catholics, looking at Catholic social teaching, perhaps in contrast to the theater and the communication discipline or in the arts looking at the, the depiction of Catholic intellectual tradition in painting and sculpture. One can find a lot of themes in education and themes related to ethics, care, responsibility in nursing and medicine, in the social scientists, a historical perspective or Catholic social justice, Catholic social teaching, provide opportunities for diplomacy, international relationship, relations, and some of the social sciences, and ethics and community offer perspectives and possibility in business and related disciplines. One can view economics as related to Catholic social teaching, and for that matter, Islamic and Jewish perspectives, which we have done, but this tends to be a fair amount harder in the formal and natural sciences. Within, by the natural sciences, we tend to mean physics, biology, chemistry, and all their interactions and ramifications. And the formal sciences comprise meta mathematics, computer science, logic, data, 
status. So in, say, mathematics or chemistry, well, generally the requirement for a core three course is that it has to be a legitimate third year course that could be taken by majors for an elective, but it has to be accessible to most juniors in any discipline with no formal prerequisites beyond those first two signature courses. It should elaborate on and extend themes of those courses and must include readings and an emphasis on Catholic intellectual tradition and its themes, and the responses need to be a major part of the course grade. Generally, we want it to be interdisciplinary, engaging not only Catholic intellectual and Catholic social traditions and the host discipline, but bringing in other disciplines at least tangentially. And it needs a substantial required per term artifact, almost a capstone level with a paper presentation, visual presentation, possibly a group project. And all of these cannot just be developed by the host discipline. It requires approval by the core three, the core office and the core three program, by the academic departments involved, by the relevant college bodies, including the Catholic studies program in a lot of cases and our curriculum program, which is the educational policy committee in our College of Arts and Sciences and the university academic policy committee in principle. The problem in the natural and formal sciences is that this contrasts with characteristics of those programs where electives tend to be in a very deep program. The program is very large and has deep and broad prerequisite sequences. There are courses in upper level mathematics or computer science that may require two or three courses directly and half a dozen courses indirectly. And most of the upper level courses are going to use the beginning that was developed in the first two years and explore theoretical or conceptual underpinnings, investigate important subdisciplines such as organic chemistry within chemistry, or look at application areas. And electives ideally are going to address one or more of those or be research oriented or both. So an important question is, now that we're in the natural sciences, how can we fit in an elective that can be taken both by majors and non-majors that is legitimate for the majors, but also accessible to the non-majors? And it seemed to us in looking at this that there are four basic opportunities. Okay, well, first thing is that you can't do this with a faculty member who is tightly siloed in their own discipline. You need somebody who has an interdisciplinary focus. Fortunately, that's not so hard in STEM because an awful lot of us, including all three of us here from Seton Hall today, have a broad intellectual base. But on the other hand, we are often constrained by the department expectations, by the expectations for promotion and tenure, and by the fact that the department often doesn't want to give up a faculty member for an interdisciplinary course. So as I said, there seem to be four opportunities. We can look at an important, though perhaps tangential, conceptual or academic area, conceptual or application area, which can be introduced without overly relying on the first two years. Students with the background may have an easier time, but it has to be accessible to everyone. And students in the bad discipline will have more expected of them. Both the robotics and the human mind course, which mathematics and computer science offers in conjunction with psychology, and explores important topics in cognition, cognitive science, what you can do with robots, what you can do with artificial intelligence, and what you can't do or probably is not appropriate to do. Father Bonapane's Science and Theology of Food fits nicely in here. 
food science is a reasonable application of chemistry and of biology. It has implications as he will talk about in the social sciences, in philosophy and theology, so it's ideal. You can look at a topic that's been squeezed out of upper class study because there isn't any room, but that topic should have philosophical and historical context, must allow other students to catch up easily, but still have advanced material to be introduced. And our course in logic limits to knowledge and Catholic intellectual tradition has that comes in that area. Logic is something that most students will have seen a little of. It is, deals also with representation of knowledge and language. It is important to mathematics and computer science, and we can explore some application areas. We can deal with AI and data science and cognitive science. And it's important to the philosophy and history of mathematics and in, of computer science. And those issues are not unimportant in the Catholic intellectual tradition and Catholic social tradition. So a third possibility is a topic that's typically squeezed into courses or to be mentioned in multiple courses, but won't be a focus of them, but maybe is a reasonable focus for a separate course. So I offer evolution, as you can look at, but creation and science, which touches certainly on evolution as well as the physics of creation is a reasonable example, or a concept that's important in the disciplines, but in the common background of most undergraduates. So major ethical and social questions tend to arise here, and you can deal with that in genetics, particularly human genetics privacy, informed consent, and Catholic social teaching and its cross-cultural and cross-religious analogs may have a large role there. So that covers where can I find a course in STEM? So now let's turn to the course we actually developed. How did the course come about? How was I prepared? How did the department decide on it? And how was it skeleton fleshed out? So let's look at how I was prepared first. As mentioned by Dr. Mahfoud, I had PhDs in both mathematics and computer science, where the connection between a formal algebraic structure and a graphical formulation of information was important in each. There was an investigation of what questions can be solved and what questions cannot even in principle. Did my computer science degree, artificial intelligence, and the representation of knowledge became very important. This played in with a lifelong fascination with grammar, language structures, and communication. I was in a theater group which involved improvisation. My reading, at least a good part of it, has tend to focus on questions that are important even in the science fiction and historical fiction area. And the theme of limits to knowledge, which I'll talk about again in a few minutes, came up as important and led to a lecture at William Patterson for their honors seminar in 2012. And finally, I had a cross-disciplinary or interdisciplinary focus in many of my courses including assisting with the development of the statistics course we offer now and a course in calculus for the liberal arts, which I developed with Professor John Masterson from our mathematics department and taught for about three or four years in which the, Christ the medieval backgrounds from the scholastics and the later intellectual background was very important. And I was fortunate in this course to have the collaboration and support not only of our chair, Dr. John Sackerman, but of Father Joseph Laracy, who will speak in this webinar and whose background includes engineering, mathematics, and computing, as well as theology, and Professor Reynolds, who has a background in mathematics, humanities, and philosophy, environmental management, and software development. So how did the department decide on the course? First, it was fairly clear I would be involved, so that helped. 
We were looking for a possibility. The robotics course is a good course for our computer science major, but doesn't completely fit in mathematics. And after some discussion with the chair, he and I concluded that an advanced course in logic would benefit all the department majors. The classic and medieval context provided a significant connection to the Catholic intellectual tradition. Knowledge representation and limits to knowledge supports an interdisciplinary view. It incorporates computing, artificial intelligence, modern science, and aspects of social science. As I said on the last side, the limits to knowledge are very important to both mathematics and computing. And it could be taught without high prerequisite knowledge, although, as I'll say, some knowledge of logic is going to be very helpful and students who have had none have struggled with the course. So after figuring out that's what we wanted, we went to talk to Dr. Eric Johnston, who is our director for CORE. We talked, uh, looked at additional Catholic intellectual tradition material as he suggested we should. And in the development of the course, we came up very strongly against the Islamic gold work of the Islamic golden age and with Catholic social tradition, Catholic social teaching, Catholic social thought. We looked at extensions of logic, including modal logic, which involves both temporal logic, the logic of how things occur in time, Doxastic logic, the logic of knowledge and belief, the logic, the deontic logic, the logic of what is permissible, what is required, what is forbidden, and the logic of some worlds and any worlds, all of which have very strong connections to ethics, morality, as well as language representation. This supported further connections with philosophy, language, and knowledge representation, computer science, and so on. So we wound up with a robust, quite possibly overfull course transitioning from Aristotle to current issues in ethics, technology, and philosophy. The course biography, which bibliography, which I haven't added the latest offering to, has over 400 items. Course assignments include readings and responses, a mix of Catholic intellectual tradition, epistemology, and the philosophies of mathematics and science. The assignments, other than the readings, have been on logic and on knowledge representation. And the project requirement is an annotated bibliography, a course paper, and a presentation. As we've said, and the illustration at the left is meant to say all of these topics are interwoven, interleaved, intermeshed throughout the course. So we have logic beginning with Aristotle and the tradition. Boethius and then the medievals and the scholastics, the Islamics predicate and prepositional logic, temporal and modal logics, higher order logics in which we can deal with relations or predicates or sets as themselves objects for quantification. There is no group of human beings for which it is true that becomes a higher order logic statement. And then looking at non-monotonic reasoning, reasoning in which I may have to retract knowledge that I currently have, probabilistic and fuzzy logic in which I may have some confidence in what I'm saying or say that some predicate is true in some degree. Dr. Marlowe is intelligent at the 80% level and connections with cybernetics, which allow for feedback loops and interaction of observer and observed, of controller and controlled. We deal heavily in the second part of the course with knowledge representation. As I've indicated, we look at the history of logic from its classical formulation through to its formalization and its use in dealing with 
computers, both theoretically and in practice, and the limits to knowledge, the three classical Euclidean unsolvable problems. Kurt Gödel, who showed that you cannot demonstrate that mathematics is both complete and consistent. And so there are going to be, since we believe mathematics is consistent, statements that are independent of your system of logic in which you can find models in which they're both true and false, where you know that they are true and perhaps and cannot prove, know that you cannot prove them. Alan Turing, who showed that there are definable mathematical sets, well-defined sets for which we cannot prove, cannot find a program that tells you whether an element is in there or not. Kenneth Arrow, who showed, if you construe what he showed narrowly, that there is no fair method of elections, more broadly and more importantly, it says that there is no absolutely fair method of arriving at a social determination of social welfare. That is something that everyone would agree is fair from individual preferences. The Heisenberg principle, which shows you can not precisely tell both of a pair of linked properties. The most famous is position and momentum, but it's also true for energy and time, for charge and something called spin. There are also a number of interesting papers we refer to that show exactly when you can cut a cake fairly and when you cannot. And that's <laughs> incredible. Applications to artificial intelligence and data science, mathematics, computer science, natural science, engineering, social sciences and economics, as we just indicated, politics, you name it. Philosophical issues, logic and meaning, philosophy of math, philosophy of science, epistemology, metaphysics, the connection of what science does with what we can deal with in philosophy and what we can deal with in theology. And Father will deal with several of those, the Catholic intellectual tradition and Catholic social teaching, connections of logic and theology, connections of science and theology. With the Stanley Yaki, Ian Barber, a Protestant theologian and I can't have Bernard Lonergan, a Catholic theologian, philosopher, and scientist, connecting these and showing how we can get to both. We've offered this course three times. We've offered a number, obviously, of the other Catholic STEM Engaging the World courses more often, a total of, I don't know how many times total. In our course, the student reaction has been positive, although some wish for more technical content and less theology and some for more theology and philosophy and less technical. Some, particularly those who have not come from the background and don't have familiarity with logic have been overwhelmed with the breadth and depth. And some have been amazed and supported by the fact that we touch on so many areas. Student papers and presentations have generally been of high quality and enormous variety. At least five of the students from our course and many from the other courses have presented in our annual Petersheim Research Exposition, which is largely for student research. And one was invited to present her work at an international conference on the connection of Islamic and modern economic theory with connections to the Catholic social tradition but she couldn't attend due to COVID, although her abstract was printed in the abstracts of the conference. As a result of this course and other courses that I have been involved with and that involve the three speakers today, we have a minimum of 18 publications, seven presentations that did not result in public presenta uh, publications, a number of department seminars, colloquia at other institutions, and this program. And we have had, I believe, a positive influence on Core 3, on seminary offerings, and on the Petersheim Academic Exposition.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marlowe. Before I introduce our next presenter, I'll be right up. Be right up. I'll be right up. Thank you, Dr. Marlowe. And now I'm happy to introduce Father Gerald Bonapane, ordained a priest of the Archdiocese of New York in 2006. Father Bonapane's area of specialization is food chemistry. Prior to seminary and the priesthood, he held a number of positions in academia, the federal government, the US FDA, and in the food and pharmaceutical industries. Among the courses Father Bonapane teaches and has taught are a graduate level course in food chemistry, as well as core curriculum courses, including a core three course, science and theology of food. His research areas of interest are chemical deterioration of food lipids, oxidative reactions, essential oils as natural antioxidants, and cold plasma treatment of botanicals and essential oils. In addition to this work, Father Bonapane was appointed minister to the priest community on June 1st, 2020. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahfoud. It's uh, certainly very good to be with everyone um, uh, today. And uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to uh, follow with uh, Dr. Marlowe where he introduced really our uh, offerings here at Seton Hall uh, on um, our core three courses. Um, so I'd like to follow up and, and as he's mentioned a, a little bit to talk more specifically now about a course that I developed a few years ago titled Science and Theology of Food. Um, so what I'd like to uh, in this uh, presentation is to um, just get a pointer there for you, but uh, is to really follow through a bit of an introduction and then begin to look at the connections of food and faith, food and theology, food and science, and then, well, let's put all three together, food, faith, and science, and, uh, and then conclude with a, few, uh, with a few remarks. So the course uh, which I developed uh, in, uh, back in 2017, Science and Theology of Food, it is cross-listed uh, uh, with the core curriculum, uh, but also with uh, CAST, our Catholic Studies program, and, and certainly in our chemistry offering. So it's crossed the list with these three uh, areas. Um, basically, as you see here up on the screen, you know, what is food? You know, uh, it's something we all know, it's so ubiquitous, uh, but what is food? You know, how might we define it? Uh, really, what is eating? You know, uh, how might we look at uh, what eating entails? You know, a particular very good question that's come out of one of the textbooks that I use for the course, uh, Dr. Norman Wurzba uh, at the Duke Divinity School. Uh, but he asks this uh, profound question, why did God create a world in which every living creature must eat. So I'll get back to that question. But this is a core three. It's critical thinking. Uh, this class is taken by juniors and, and seniors, primarily the, at the senior level. But we look at the scientific, theological, theological cultural, and ethical dimensions of food. Um, we look at the chemistry of food, uh, the chemistry of all the food components, uh, certainly when we discuss food or really any kind of uh, uh, area, you know, we can think of there is risk, there's benefit issues. Uh, one particular area that we could say there's both of those are GMOs, genetically modified organisms, genetically modified foods, uh, but also the, the history and the, all the new developed food and color additives. We certainly look at the theology, the faith, the biblical perspectives on food, food aid. Uh, certainly, um, 
looking at that Catholic focus on the Holy Mass. Yes, it is a it is a sacred meal. It's a meal of thanksgiving, what has been given to us by uh, Jesus himself. But within the food tradition, not just Catholic, you know, what can we refer to as being food taboos? Uh, what's feasting? What's fasting of food? Uh, many diets offered, right? Vegan, vegetarian, uh, gluten-free. Uh, how does one go about maybe losing some weight, so weight loss plans, uh, but also uh, certainly food addictions or, or eating disorders. Uh, but we also talk about, as we put things together, uh, issues of hunger, malnutrition, uh, food security, and food sustainability. Um, this course back in 2016, and, and then as I first presented it in the fall, of 2017, it was developed uh, uh, of the, the science and theology of food was, it was inspired by this science and faith in seminary formation for college and pre-theology programs. This is a grant from the Templeton Foundation administered by John Carroll University in Ohio. Um, the goal of this program is to raise the scientific literacy of the clergy and seeks to the development of courses that connect branches of science with Catholic teaching. So over the course of teaching the course, I've had the honor really to have a good number, uh, wish there were more, but a good number of seminarians here at Seton Hall who do enroll in the course. Now, my background is as a food scientist, food chemist, and uh, being a, a Catholic priest, knowing, let's say, at least a little bit of theology, um, I, I just see it as a certainly a good fit in teaching a, a course uh, of, of, of this nature. Um, looking at, let's say, learning outcomes of the course, well, you know, I have students read uh, uh, widely, we use these two um, uh, primary texts uh, from Norman Wurzba uh, titled Food and Faith um, of the a, uh, Theology of Eating, um, and also a text or a book by Emily Stimson Chapman uh, called The Catholic Table, uh, Finding Joy where food and faith meet. So we read pretty much the entire books amongst other readings and articles and videos. So students, uh, uh, I hope, present to them a wide variety uh, in the area of food and its science and theology. Now the students articulate these areas, science, theology, culture, social, ethical dimensions of food uh, in writing what I would call these critical thinking essays. That is, what have we've talked about? What are you thinking about? Where are you, you know, in this world today, this quite challenging world? How do you take all of these issues and, you know, put them together in hopefully a, a nicely uh, uh, developed essay. And uh, so have them kind of think about all of these areas. Um, I do have them near the end of the semester, come as a group, three or four students, and develop a, uh, a hopefully a, a clear, well thought out oral presentation on a particular topic that we've touched on, but not so specific uh, in terms of what we've already talked about, something that maybe they have derived out of the uh, uh, different uh, topics in the course and developed some kind of a twist on that in an oral presentation. Um, we do develop an understanding of the church's call to provide food security, food sustainability, feed the poor, both locally, globally, um, I have them prepare, I've done this the last two or three semesters, prepare a food security and sustainability plan for a particularly underdeveloped and poverty rich country. So students, uh, I found really, I've enjoyed these, 
writings uh, in writing about a particular area, a particular nation, and uh, what's going on there. Uh, and so they, they've been very uh, uh, instructive for me. Uh, you know, I don't have to tell you, my friends, uh, uh, back in the um, mid-80s when I was teaching at a small liberal liberal arts college in, in Boston, I taught a course on malnutrition and hunger. And um, I remember back then, you know, all of the, the hunger and all that's all throughout the world. And here we are now, what, 40 years later or so, still talking, and it's all out there as well. Perhaps even a, more present locally now than what we used to see uh, back those years. Um, hopefully from the class, the students uh, can put into motion some kind of a plan to improve their own well-being, right? And others as well through what we would call well-balanced meals and proper exercise. Now that's this particular fifth point. Um, I do have in mind, you know, uh, the seminarian and the priest he is to become. You know, a priest gets it ordained, they, most of them go into a rectory living, and are they taking care of themselves? Are they eating well, you know, amongst all of the busyness of the ministry? So, but that's for the priest seminarian, uh, but for all of us as well to put, you know, put this into, into action. Um, the Catholic intellectual tradition, yeah, this is a term we hear all the time, here at Seton Hall, where we talk about it all the time, we've developed various committees to address uh, the CIT. But this is, yeah, it's, it's something we've been talking and dialoguing about for 2,000 years. And it is a way to integrate faith and reason, faith and culture. And as I have this point at the bottom of the slide, uh, this relationship between faith and science is a core principle of the Catholic intellectual uh, tradition. But Catholicism aims for understanding the world around us, uh, bringing each of us closer to God. So Dr. Marlowe spoke about, you know, uh, a, a, a course on logic. Well, how do we, how does that help us better understand the world? And in that way, how does it bring us closer to God. So I would dare say that any uh, discipline, science, uh, uh, a humanities discipline, whatever it might be, uh, we make that relation certainly to what we would refer to as this, uh, this wonderful tradition. Uh, here at Seton Hall, certainly we want to connect the tradition with our own university mission, our own Catholic mission. But this tradition draws on many texts, you know, as I do in this course, sacred scripture. I look at scripture, I look at food references, um, different formulations of faith, you know, and then th these can be in uh, some kind of uh, catechesis, uh, you know, even some kind of drama, religious drama, fiction, poetry, uh, what have you. What is that? How is that faith presented in that particular venue. Uh, certainly in the natural sciences, you know, how do we integrate human knowledge uh, from this, these sciences, you know, how do we relate that to, to faith? Uh, certainly spirituality and prayer, you know, rules for living, devotions, uh, you know, uh, hagi hagiography, lives of the saints, role models, pilgrimages, you know, different forms of prayer, uh, how we can relate that to, to food, and various rituals uh, in music, art, architecture. So, you know, I, I have the students at the very beginning of the course, we take a, a good amount of time, let's discuss this Catholic intellectual tradition. Now, they've had it before, they've had it at probably in core one, core two, and again, they'll have it in this core three course. So it's still a term that maybe is a bit fuzzy. I think in my own mind, it can be. Uh, but uh, let's, as we talk about it more and dialogue about it, uh, to have a more clear understanding.
So the first connection that I want to address today is food and faith, food and theology. You know, certainly as we look at sacred scripture or whatever, we just look out there and and whatever we can see uh, growing on the tree or we in our backyard garden, whatever it might be. And certainly in the grocery stores, the, the, the food markets, the roadside stands, whatever it might be. God is giving us a great variety of, of food, these edible goods, but really this gift that God gives to us. So certainly a point I make in the class is that uh, we don't want to look at food as something like fuel. We just take it in, we eat it, chew on it, we drink it, it's fuel, we keep going. But no, let's look at it uh, as a true gift of God and look at the great variety it is you know as it brings us comfort and healing uh brings us together in community certainly father leo made that point very strongly you know community sitting down at the table with family with friends isn't the food so much better when we're around the table with those we enjoy being with so certainly the joy of it yeah, God is, gives us all of it. He's, he is love. He is good. Certainly he loves us. You know, Emily uh, Chapman makes the point in her, in her book, you know, God gives us all of these great things. Uh, he gives us even something called bacon jam. So you see this up here on a, a wonderful uh, muffin or croissant or whatever, it, biscuit, it, whatever it might be. So we can imagine many of us love bacon and then to spread it as a jam on something maybe that's just come baked out of the oven. Uh, boy, that, that, that sounds pretty good. So God gives us all of these great things, but he gives us himself. He gives us his body and his blood uh, in, in the Holy Eucharist. If we look at sacred scripture, we look through the Holy Bible, uh, it's everywhere. You know, maybe it's on every other page of the of the Bible, certainly beginning, um, you know, at the very beginning in Genesis, right at the beginning there, we're in the Garden of Eden. And there we've got food references right there. But we go all the way out to Calvary. Jesus there, even on the cross, right? Something about, yeah, I thirst. Physically, I thirst, Jesus is. But he's thirsting also in a more broad, a more humanitarian, or thinking of everyone on the cross. How, how do I thirst? How do you thirst? But we can take that all the way to Revelation, the very end of the Bible, the last book there, the marriage supper of the lamb. So again, food, we don't want to look at it as just we go into a filling station, get what we need, and then we go on. So it's more than just fuel for the body. You know, throughout scripture, yeah, great references to bread. Dare I say, good bread. Buono pane. Sorry for that. But bread, oil, wine, figs and fig trees. You know, we hear choice roasts of meat. We can imagine Jesus there on the shore of of the lake, a lake of Genesee there, um, freshly caught fish. And he himself preparing breakfast for those disciples out on the water. And his words, come and eat, right? Uh, Come with me. Let's share this meal. Food comforts, you know, we see in Psalm 104, it strengthens our hearts. It nourishes, it restores energy. You know, Jesus, you know, this uh, daughter of this synagogue official, Jairus, you know, they think she died, the, the young the young girl. But Jesus says, no, don't fear that. She's sleeping, she awakens, And right away, Jesus says, give her something to eat. You know, food sits very beautifully at the center of community 
and liturgical celebrations. It's a gift of kindness offered to friends and strangers alike. We can think of Abraham. We just had this reading past Sunday in the book of Genesis. These three, let's say, strangers come upon Abraham. And, well, Abraham thinks, oh, they've come a ways. Stay a while. Let me fix something for you to eat. Let's share this meal before you go on more on your journey. So it is a way to bring us together. So we would say food connects us to the memberships of creation and to God. So as I mentioned, yeah, food is really throughout uh, sacred scripture. This depiction here of the multiplication of the, 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 the loaves and the fish, right? This is a miracle of Jesus Christ where he's eating, he's feeding what? 5,000, seven, whatever it might be, thousands of people, uh, children, men and women, all of them on the hillside there, on the grassy, uh, sitting on the grassy side, hillside there. They've come to him to hear his teaching, but his heart, you know, has pity for them. They're hungry, physically hungry. We must feed them. And so we see this in all of the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this particular uh, 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 beautiful miracle uh, within the gospel. So, you know, we look at this beautiful artwork uh, and showing Christ feeding uh, those. In sacred scripture, we can also look to food as salvation or food saves. So we can think back about the Israelites having been enslaved all those hundreds of years, let's say, in Egypt and then being set free. But it all comes to what? That meal to set them free is the Passover. So, right, we can uh, think about this scripture and how it words it, but the roasted lamb, unleavened bread, bitter herbs, their loins girded, they're ready to flee. But we have this meal and then we're off into the wilderness, off into freedom from enslavement, off to the promised land, that land filled of milk and honey. So that's a, a, a meal of saving the Israelites. Now later, as they're settled into their new home, you know, there now we've got another kind of meal in the promised land. This involves King David. And so food here uh, was not so much in terms of let's out of enslavement or deliverance, but uh, it was to give thanks for that. And so this Toda meal was offered typically. So if someone was rescued from, let's say, dire straits, or uh, there'd be some kind of a bloodless sacrifice of bread uh, and, and, and wine. So these two kinds of uh, uh, meals we see in scripture pointing to foods saving qualities. But it leads us to God giving us of himself. So both the Passover, the Toda, you know, they lead to what we would call an entirely different kind of meal. That is one that is uh, a, means of, uh, a means of salvation, but also a thanksgiving for salvation. And that is the Eucharist, this word meaning thanksgiving. And so up in that upper room on Holy Thursday, uh, be the night before he would be uh, crucified, um, Jesus says, yeah, this is my body around that table in the upper room. It's given for you, this body, the cup of my blood. It will be shed for you. Um, and then he goes and goes to the agony in the garden, right? He goes and he's, he's given that cross. He treks up the hill to Calvary and he goes to the cross and dies for all of us then and throughout whoever would be following. Um, 
and he gives us of himself. And we celebrate that in the Holy Mass, right? We have every Holy Mass is that, uh, that, that representation of that sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But it's, it's not the end, the cross, right? We go through the cross, but he comes off that cross. And so on Easter Sunday, the beautiful reading from St. Luke in his chapter 24, the road to Emmaus, right? Jesus walks with these two disciples for miles. They don't know who this is, uh, but then they recognize him in the home and he takes the bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, gives it to them. They recognize him. And so this is the Eucharist. This is the new Passover, the new Toda meal. Uh, but the bread and the wine, uh, yeah, become him, become his own body uh, and his own blood. My friends, the, the next connection that I, I make in the class is to, uh, Laura, we looked at, let's say, faith. We don't want to forget that, but we now want to kind of switch gears a little bit and look at, well, food and science. Now, for me, this is an area that, you know, I thank God that I've got a, a, a bit of a background in it. But uh, and so the students, again, I'm, I'm speaking to, yeah, the majority come from a chemistry biology background. So they, they're good scientists, uh, but they may not have so much. How do I apply this chemistry, this organic chemistry or whatever analytical chemistry, or how do I apply a particular area of biology like microbiology to food? So we make that connection in this part of the course. Um, now food, right? It's, it, it's living, it's breathing, it's respiring. You know, we go into the market and look at fresh fruits and vegetables. They're, they're still living, they're still breathing, still respiring, although we would say, as Emily Chapman says, they're in the twilight of their lives in that grocery store. But food is, um, you know, it's it's made up of, of all that we're made up of, right? The, these elements of carbon and hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, all of these, and how do they interact with one another? We, food, uh, as well, susceptible to chemical microbiological changes. So I speak to the students about food chemistry. So we look at these, what I would call these kind of major uh, biomolecules, the lipid or fat component, the protein, the carbohydrate. Um, uh, the one that I should have there as well is water. You know, most food or certainly fresh food, most of it is water. We talk about water quite a bit, but also the, 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 the lesser amounts in the food, the vitamins, the minerals, what have you. Uh, we don't want, want to forget also uh, things like food toxins, chemical toxins that could even get into our food supply. We look a little bit at, at food microbiology, so bacteria, yeast, molds and viruses uh, in, in, in our food. We look at science of food in the sense that, yeah, okay, we, we look at all of these food components, how do they interact chemically, microbiologically? How does food you know, change in a, let's say, using a word like oxidation? Food oxidizes, what happens to it? Well, it doesn't taste as great as it, it originally did doesn't look as great, doesn't smell as great uh, as it did because of whatever chemical or microbiological change. But, you know, we do eat, we need to be nourished, we need to consume uh, calories, uh, we need to take in protein and fat and carbohydrate, vitamins, all of these things. So we do look at you know, eating a well-balanced diet and looking at what we should eat. So, you know, from our food packaging and food labels, you'll see these, this reference daily intake, percent daily value. So in this particular uh, package or this, I, I buy a, a, a nice package of, let's say, chocolate chip cookies. Okay, maybe not the most nutritious, but well, how much fat is in each cookie? So you'll see that in terms of, uh, you know, 
8% daily value. So we look at protein, we look at the carbohydrate, you know, what percent should they be of our total calories? We look at fat, you know, for total calories per day, uh, for the, let's say the adult uh, male, about 2,500, for the woman, about 2,000 total calories per day. If we go back to this friend that I hope one day to uh, uh, consume, the bacon jam, well, in one ounce, we're going to consume 80 calories, uh, six grams of fat, three grams of sugar. Um, I make it a point because, yeah, Americans, uh, you know, we're, we've gotten obese. We've gotten overweight. Uh, you know, more later, more uh, kind of recent statistics, uh, 73% or more of Americans are overweight or obese. And so we got to be careful of how much sugar, simple sugar, are we consuming? Uh, how much salt? are we putting on our food? Don't forget the processed foods. That, can, that thing can sit in a can for years and years, but what might be preserving it? Probably a good amount of sodium chloride in there, salt, uh, but also the fat. So we look at that, that we wanna be careful how much we consume of that. Uh, also in some way, I'll talk about how we metabolize food. So how, you know, in terms of nutrient absorption, we eat something, is it absorbed? Do we get, you know, the quality, the energy, whatever coming from that? Uh, or is it malabsorbed? So, you know, we, we talk about things of that nature uh, in, the, in this section. Now, I do uh, select a few topics within the science section that are timely, they're out there. Uh, one particular is the biotechnology, genetically modified food, uh, genetically modified organisms. So um, I'm sure all of you, have, you know, you're familiar with the term biotech and GMOs, uh, but we use biology, you know, genetic engineering, molecular biology, and we can change at the DNA level, that genetic level, we can change the, the makeup of the genes. Uh, an example, right, we can transfer genes to produce something improved, something novel, something that uh, uh, for many years now, uh, it, we transfer genes from a particular fish species into a strawberry to help that strawberry better withstand frost you know, depending on uh, the temperature there in the field. Biotech is certainly not new, right? We've been breeding plants and animals uh, for a long, long, many hundreds and hundreds of years, and it, more than that, to improve their food value. Uh, we then, you know, using something like yeast to make the good bread, uh, to make wine, uh, to make beer. So GMOs are plants, they're animals, they're microorganisms. Uh, we modify the genetic makeup uh, uh, and uh, in order then to give them a new property. So we can increase the nutritional content. Now, one wonderful application of GMOs is what we call golden rice. So in the Far East, in areas where rice is grown so, so much, rice typically was low in vitamin A. And we need vitamin A. Vitamins, the, the name means vital amine. It, we need it. It's vital to our health and well-being. Uh, so we developed something through biotech called golden rice. We were able to add vitamin A into rice that originally was deficient in A. So it has a bit of more of a golden color, but it's proved so very successful uh, to those people, particularly living in the Far East. We can improve texture, color, flavor, you know, let it better withstand the growing season. We can increase yield of grains, wheat, whatever it might be. We can allow something to be, have greater resistance 
against any disease or, or pest. Uh, they can better tolerate herbicides. Now, this last one I put there, and there are uh, many more applications, but, you know, to, to to tolerate better herbicides, okay, that's good. Uh, but there, if you're familiar with uh, some of these marketed products, um, you know, there are some what we would call risks involved if we're transferring whatever gene and making something more uh, tolerant uh, to a herbicide. So, uh, and we get into, again, these risk benefit issues. Um, so that's a little bit on that second connection, food and science. Then at the end of the course or near the end, all right, everyone, let's put the three together. Okay, we've got food. Uh, we've talked about faith. And now we've talked about science. So how do we put the three together? Well, you know, certainly uh, we could call the most basic principle of Christian moral life uh, that every person bears the dignity of being created in the image and likeness of God. So we have to act morally. and But that too, in acting morally, it, there's a call. We've got to make sure our foods are safe. They're efficacious. You know, that new additive we developed. And when I worked for the Food and Drug Administration back in the uh, late 80s, early and into the 1990s, um, we looked at food. I, I worked with food and color additives. We got, want to make sure that that particular additive is doing what the, you know, the manufacturer uh, says it will do, that it is efficacious. Uh, we need to have enough food for everyone. And you know, we hear it. There's enough food in the world for everyone to eat. It's sad, though. Not everyone gets that food. In the labeling of food, true and honest labeling. Avoid adulteration, misbranding of food. You know, reminds me from St. Matthew's Gospel, uh, Jesus saying, which one of you would hand his son a stone when he asked for a loaf of bread or a snake when he asked for a fish? A key question, and we spend some time with this, we do some reading uh, from the experts on genetically modified foods, those who are uh, favor the use of them and those who are dead set against using them are GMOs safe to eat? Do they tinker with God's creation? Do they tinker with his gifts? So we come down to the food risk benefit issues. Um, an area from Norman Wurzba, again, uh, his text on food and faith, a theology of eating. Uh, Norman, again, he teaches there at the Duke Divinity School. He's not Catholic. He's he's. He's a, a, a Protestant, Protestant tradition, but he speaks uh, really powerfully about we've come into exile ecologically, economically, and physiologically. We're not taking care of our God's creation in the environment, in the water, the soil, the air. Economically, how is it we're not able to get food to everyone throughout the world when we have more than enough? Physiologically, again, we go back, are we taking care of ourselves? You know, the salt, the fat, right? All of the sugar kind of controversy. Are we, you know, aware of that? Uh, feeding the hungry, food security, sustainability. Now, to the Catholic Church, every human person is sacred, and every person has a right to life and to the material, spiritual support to have what we would call a truly human existence. So the right to enough food to sustain a life with dignity, that is for, uh, for everyone. Now, following with Norman Wurzba, he gets into... Uh, you know, the, the kind of these agricultural and ecological problems, you know, more on this exile we're in. But he speaks about that, you know, uh, it, I guess technically we're in what we would call this Holocene epic 
this era of the world. Uh, but Wurzba argues, no, we moved out of that. We're into what he would call an Anthropocene epic. That is one that's dominated by us, human ambition, human power, human mastery. We're forgetting about all other parts of God's creation. Uh, so where is it? Can there be faithful eating in an Anthropocene world? Where is it points to this term echo modernists, uh, referring to politicians, economists, engineers, uh, they welcome this Anthropocene. They believe that people will be able to engineer themselves out of the agricultural and ecological problems we now face. But there's this decoupling of humans from nature. That is this goal of the Anthropocene. So again, it puts us into ecological, economic, physiological uh, exile. Uh, these eco-modernists, uh, you know, as words but rights, yeah, they, they kind of uh, affirm a deep love and emotional connection to the natural world. But he argues, Wurzba argues, the connection is mostly aesthetic, emotive, uh, and, and optional. How can we better become with others? You know, that's the Holy Trinity, right? That Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that one God in three persons, and the sharing between the three of them, and the relationship between the three of them. Now, this word perichoresis, that is being with others or becoming with others. So that's, my friends, where we are, where we've got a lot of work to do to better be with others. And, you know, who are the others? Well, I'm thinking about the water we drink. Uh, you know, the, uh, all the other creatures that are not human, but also the soil, uh, the, the water, the air, and all of that. Um, you know, one uh, particular topic is that, uh, you know, in our big farms today, right, the little farmer is being squeezed out more and more, let's say within the U.S., and the big conglomerates, the big farmers take over, but they tend to be monocultural. That is a, I'm sorry, monocrop. They grow one crop again and again and again, and they leave out the diversity of the crop. They leave out the diversity of God's creation. And that one crop, that monoculture kind of thing, um, depletes the soil so rapidly. And so we're not thinking about soil as part of God's creation as well. So again, better becoming uh, with others. Um, just some concluding remarks on the next uh, couple of slides. But all of us, as I tell uh, the students, uh, let's appreciate more and more God's great gift of food. Uh, allow eating to be a spiritual exercise, a community affair. Eat with others. Even though our lives are so busy, the, the, the students here on campus, um, you know, at the end of the day, maybe at least come together, you know, maybe put the books aside for a few minutes, but sit around the table, enjoy a meal together. So go beyond, again, food is just a fuel or as a commodity. Uh, Eating should be a sharing in and a sharing of the blessings of God. Uh, have a better awareness of the long history of the interdisciplinary nature of food. It's faith, it's theology, and science. Be more of an informed consumer, eat healthy, weigh the risk-benefit issues of food. Um, now, one part of the course I want to do better with respect other religious traditions beyond Catholicism or the Christian tradition, because I have a number of students coming from the Islam, the Hindu, uh, the Jewish uh, tradition, and other traditions. Uh, let's talk more about them, and this is where I depend on the students. Tell us more about your tradition. What are your feasts throughout the year? So respect other food traditions. And all of us are in this together 
feed the hungry, help to ensure food security uh, for all. Now, having taught the class for five semesters, um, yeah, I see students really interested uh, in, in embracing this relationship between faith and science and resolving any conflict between the two. I don't really see a conflict among students, although we might read to say that, you know, uh, faith and science are so separate. Many people will tell you that, but I'm, I'm optimistic that and, and, and uh, been uh, so, uh, you know, grateful for students to know they, they, they have this relationship. Let's just take a look at it in more uh, detail. Uh, but I've been seeing, as I mentioned earlier, excellent uh, writings of food security, sustainability plans, uh, writing about various countries throughout the world. Uh, their oral group presentations uh, have been uh, have been really very excellent, and uh, and so uh, you know these students uh, again, majority are coming from a science background, uh, uh, but they, they do. And they'll tell me this, they do see this experience in other faith and science uh, courses, certainly the one you'll hear about very shortly from Father Joseph Laracy on creation and science, but they see these, certainly the logic course as well, uh, that it's valuable to whatever they're going to be doing uh, in the future. So uh, here at Seton Hall, we make a big point, and, and we should, about being a servant leader. And so these kinds of interdisciplinary courses um, are very helpful in forming them to be uh, better and better uh, uh, servant leaders. Um, so everyone, I thank you so much for your kind uh, attention. So good to, uh, uh, to be with you. Thank you, Father Bonapain. Now I'm pleased to introduce Father Joseph Laracy. Father Laracy is a priest of the Archdiocese of Newark and serves as Assistant Professor of Systematic Theology at Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology, Seton Hall University. He is also an affiliated faculty member with the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, as well as the Catholic Studies Program. Father Laracy is the author of Theology and Science and the Thought of Ian Barber, a Thomistic Evaluation for the Catholic Doctrine of Creation, Peter Lang, 2021 and the co-editor of Stanley Yaki Foundation International Congress, Grace Wing 2020. His scholarly articles have appeared in publications such as The Seminary Journal, Logos, The Journal of Systemics, Cybernetics, and Informatics, The Journal of Religion and Theology, The International Journal of Communications, Network, and System Sciences. Thank you so much. Okay, can everyone see the slides? Wonderful. So I'm going to speak to you uh, briefly today about my course, Creation and Science, which like the other two courses uh, we heard about this morning is a highly interdisciplinary course. Uh, the overarching goal is to deepen the student's understanding of the relationship between the Catholic theology of creation and modern science. And we bring the theology of creation into conversation with a number of scientific areas. Some of these are historical, looking at the birth of science and the philosophical environment that supported it. We look at the interventions of the Holy Fathers, especially over the last 250 years to the theology and science interaction. We examine what does science tell us about the specificity of our cosmos, its unity and beauty, the importance of a robust realist epistemology in metaphysics, and the significance of the doctrine of creation from nothing and with time. And then we get into a dialogue with a, a, a number of contemporary areas of science, such as Big Bang cosmology, evolutionary biology. We examine the role of mathematics in natural science, issues associated with ecology and the climate. I have a wonderful visiting 
lecturer come in to talk about food, chemistry, and theology. Some of you may know him. And we also get into the relationship of the theology of the human person, anthropology, and modern psychology, looking especially at the insights of Viktor Frankl. So creation and science uh, looks at how the church uh, built on the accomplishments of some of the great civilizations of antiquity in their investigations of the modern world. And we pay particular attention to the significance of the fruitful dialogue of Aristotelian philosophy with the doctrine of creation. Throughout the class, we, we look at a number of primary sources, uh, biblical sources, church documents, as well as the writings of the great pre-Christian -civiliza pre civilizations. Think of uh, India, China, Greece, Rome, etc. So we have a number of objectives. We want to introduce students to the history of science. For many of them, this is their first uh, introduction to the history of science. They've taken many science courses, but they don't know about the development of science. Uh, we explicate our Catholic theology of creation, and again, look at the writings of the popes from about the last 250 years. Theological method and scientific method is also a key theme. We want to clarify these methods and draw out the similarities and differences. And then introduce the fundamentals of a number of scientific areas so that we can engage in this dialogue with Catholic theology. I always begin the course uh, with the question, what is creation? And many, many of the students, their, their, their minds go to the beginning of the book of Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, when it is revealed that God is the creator of heaven and earth. And we look at the writings of the fathers of the church. Um, right after the apostolic period, the, the, the early fathers, uh, we see already are writing about creation. And they are affirming that God is the creator of the world that he didn't create from pre-existing material, he created from nothing. He created directly without secondary causes. You and I need secondary causality, right? If we're building something, we need tools. If we're working on a computer, we need a keyboard and a mouse. God creates directly. And God also creates with time. One of the early Christian writers we look at is Hippolytus of Rome. So again, as you can see, very, very early on in Christian history, around the year 230, we have churchmen writing about God the Creator. And as mentioned a moment ago, Scripture is a major source in this course, as should be in all theology courses, and we, we look at for example, where scripture teaches that we can know of creation, we can know about God the creator, even by reason alone. Both in the Old and New Testament, we have these teachings that knowledge of God the creator can come from reason. In fact, uh, the church believes that this biblical teaching is so important it was solemnly declared at the First Vatican Council. De Filius teaches us that God, who is both our creator and our end, can be known with certainty from the things which were created through the natural light of reason. Our Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI has written and preached extensively about the doctrine of creation, and one of the documents we examine is his homily on the Solemnity of the Epiphany in 2011. And it's there that he points out quite beautifully how the Magi, who were not Jewish, they were not Christian, 
but they were people that were certain that something we could describe as the signature of God exists in creation and that this can and must be pursued, discovered, deciphered. Again, to stay rooted in sacred scripture, we look at a number of passages from the Old Testament and the New Testament revealing aspects uh, which all contribute to our Catholic theology of creation, beginning in Genesis, getting into the prophetic literature, the Psalms, the end of the Old Testament with Second Maccabees. Again, we have this clear teaching about the ex nihilo aspect. God did not make the earth out of things that existed, thus also mankind comes into being. And looking to the New Testament, the Pauline corpus, St. Paul echoes this teaching that God gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. The letter to the Hebrews. The world was created by the word of God. And the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. One source that we use in the class is a, a collection of homilies given by Benedict entitled, In the Beginning, A Catholic Understanding of the Story of Creation and Fall. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. And this is just one excerpt. I won't read it to you. Um, that, that would, this is already enough of a violation of PowerPoint rules, posting a big quote. But it's such a beautiful quote about how the study of science leads us to contemplate God the creator. And Benedict says that the universe is not the product of darkness and unreason. It comes from intelligence, freedom, and from the beauty that is identical with love. We also engage non-Christian, non-theistic sources in the class. Um, Stephen Hawking and Leonard um, Moldenau have a, a very interesting book called The Grand Design. And in that book, they say that because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. And so we try to dig into what do they mean by create? Obviously, they mean something very different than what a Jew or Christian or Muslim would, would mean by creation. For Catholics, for our doctrine of creation, we, we're talking about creation from nothing. And Gravity is a property of matter. You need to have mass to have gravity. Uh, there needs to be something. You, you don't get something from nothing. And so we, we, we examine this philosophically to understand where others are coming from. We also look at the contribution of churchmen throughout the ages to natural science in the 20th century, one of the greatest free scientists, of course, was Monsignor Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian mathematician and physicist uh, who made contributions in, in a number of areas of science, but is most famous for formulating the Big Bang hypothesis in the 1920s. One way that we uh, distinguish our theology of creation from the, the natural sciences is, as William Carroll pointed out, science studies change. It excludes an absolute beginning of the universe because a, 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 such a beginning could not be a change. Any change presupposes some reality which there is to change. The 19th century into the 20th century, scientist and historian of science, Pierre Duhem, is another bright light for us in, in creation and science. And it's Duhem who points out that while the empirical sciences offer a mathematical description of nature, science does not explain. We often need other disciplines in support, such as philosophy. And the contemporary mathematical physicist Carlo Lancelotti teaches us that 
Science doesn't address the metaphysical question of how an object can be and how it can be formed. It only knows the object as a certain aspect of its being, often uh, something that can be quantified, something that can be measured. And Lancelotti points out that this is where the trouble can begin if we're not recognizing the abstraction that we're making. And that this abstraction of quantity of measure does not exhaust the intelligibility of the object. So turning again to Benedict and that epiphany homily, Benedict taught us that we know by both reason and faith that the universe is not the result of chance. In contemplating it, we are asked to interpret in it something profound, the wisdom of the creator, the inexhaustible creativity of God, and his infinite love for us. Two of the main scholars in the theology and science space that I have developed this course around are Father Stanley Yaki and Ian Barber. Father Yaki was a Hungarian Benedictine with doctorates in theology and physics, who served for most of his career as a distinguished professor of physics at Seton Hall University. Father Yaki is the author of many, many articles and books in the theology and science space. And for anyone interested in the field, I highly recommend his work. It truly has changed my life. And I see much of my ministry in education as continuing the good work that he started. The second figure, as I just mentioned, is Ian Barber, an experimental physicist, a Protestant theologian, PhD in physics from Chicago, he studied under Fermi, and then during a sabbatical, he went to Yale Divinity School and earned his divinity degree. And like Yaki, uh, made lasting contributions to the theology and science area, uh, emphasizing as well the importance of epistemology and metaphysics as bridge disciplines between science and theology. Just want to conclude with this quote from Pope St. John Paul II. Uh, this is taken from a letter that he wrote to the then director of the Vatican Observatory. And I think it, it very uh, succinctly reminds us why the theology science interaction is so important and why the church must be engaged in it. So if you'd like to, to read more uh, about some of these topics, uh, a few years ago, we hosted a wonderful conference at Seton Hall uh, on Stanley Yaki and his enduring contribution. And the essays from that conference have been collected in a volume published by Grace Wing. Uh, I was privileged to co-edit that with Father Paul Hafner. And as mentioned in the introduction, uh, I recently published a book on the thought of Ian Barber, engaging his thought from a Catholic to mystic perspective. And on behalf of Dr. Marlowe and Father Bonapain, uh, we would like to extend our thanks uh, to our colleagues here at Seton Hall, uh, to our colleagues at ITEST, at the Institute for Informatics and Systemics, and all of our family and friends who have supported us over the years in, in this work. Thank you very much. Now we begin our Q&A session. Leading the session will be Dr. Marianne Erlakis. Classically lettered in philosophy and bioethics, Dr. Erlakis is an independent bioethicist who provides ethical consultation, support, and advocacy to individuals and institutions. Her work involves continued research, particularly within the scope of the history of medical ethical praxis, the philosophical and theological underpinnings of sound moral reasoning, and the value of virtue ethics and natural law. She is staunchly pro-life and advocates for the rights of vulnerable human persons, specifically those at the edges of life, the unborn, the terminally ill, and the elderly. She is co-founder and executive director of the Dignitas Persona Institute for Nascent Human Life and will be presenting an ITES webinar in November. 
2022. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for all of the presenters. Um, I've got one question to ask for all, for all of you. Uh, could you briefly comment um, on the student papers that you've seen over the years and how you as uh, educators, some of you as priests, how the interaction with the students has, um, uh, what you have learned from this interaction. Um, uh, could we start with uh, uh, Dr. Marlowe? Um, and could each of you comment? We've, we've had an enormous variety. <clears throat> I just want to, for example, deal with the four that were presented at our research symposium this year. One was on logic, humor, and the Catholic intellectual tradition. A second was on apophasis, uh, describing God via negative rather than positive statements. One was on data science, privacy, and Catholic social teaching. And another was on artificial intelligence, medicine, and human dignity. And the breadth has been astonishing. I have learned from some of the students. I, In the preparation for the course, I've seen something about some of the other religious traditions, but I've got to learn a lot more about it from pe people who have come from the Muslim or Hindu or Jewish background, or people who had particular side interests. As I said, our one student did a wonder, who was in fact Hindu, did a wonderful paper on modern economic theory, Islamic economic theory, and Christian social, to Catholic social tradition. And it was just absolutely informative. I, I, but we've worked always with the students as I said, this course has been team taught all the time with me and father or me and Professor Reynolds. And the interaction of the two faculty with the students has enriched the experience for all of us, I think. Thank you. Father Bonapane? Yeah, I think uh, certainly to follow Dr. Marlowe, I, I, yeah, I, 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 my, the papers that the students write for me are typically as I presented, let's say, a food and faith connection to write about that, food and science write something about it. I talk a little bit about the sustainability of food security. So um, yeah, I, what I, my interest is, is are they getting the connection? Are they elaborating on the connection? And it may not necessarily, necessarily be a Catholic connection per se, it could be something within their own religious tradition. But uh, but uh, always, yeah, I, you know, uh, they're well thought out. And uh, uh, again, with the sustainability and security, uh, their own research and, uh, you know, a country that uh, maybe they have uh, some ancestral, you know, connection with or whatever, but just, uh, uh, you know, putting in something well thought out again and, and how they can, uh, you know, really improve in that particular uh, nation. So uh, uh, yeah, the critical thinking, I think it's been kind of drilled into them through their career here at Seton Hall and then putting it down into this particular kind of uh, area. You know, again, very, very, uh, uh, you know, I'm always so grateful for the, for the work that they do. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Father Larissi, what have you learned from the student papers? I've had a, a, a similar experience to Dr. Marlowe and Father Bonapane. I've been generally very, very impressed with, with the student research projects. The students come from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, you know, a seminary would obviously have a strong background in philosophy and theology, but not necessarily in science. Uh, somebody majoring in physics or, or biology would have a strong science background, but be light on the philosophy and theology. Uh, but they all they all make a serious effort at engaging in this interdisciplinary space. And it's, it's in the vast majority of cases, a very fruitful uh, project. And as, as has been the experience with my colleagues, also having non-Catholic, non-Christian students has been beneficial. I've had wonderful student projects, for example, from a, uh, a young woman of uh, the Muslim faith who did a project comparing and contrasting Catholic and Islamic theologies of creation. I had a, a young man who, uh, who's Hindu do a project looking at comparing and contrasting Catholic and Hindu perspectives on evolution. 
And so all of, all of us benefit um, from these, not only uh, interdisciplinary theology science work, but also uh, interfaith work. So there's the dialogue can go on at, at many levels and the students generally work very hard at that. Thank you. That wraps up our Q&A. Thank you everyone for your participation in this webinar. Thank you especially to Father Leo Padalinghug, Dr. Thomas Marlowe, Father Gerald Bonapane, Father Joseph Laracy, and Dr. Mary Interlacus. In conclusion, Sister Carla May Streeter, a Dominican sister and professor emerita at Aquinas Institute of Theology, will offer our closing prayer. Sister Carla May. Thank you, Sebastian, and thank you to all of our presenters. Most Holy One, you have woven for us a tapestry of many threads today. You have broadened our understanding. You have bonded yourself with us in the person of your Son, Christ Jesus, who has become our very food. He has joined us in the joys and limitations of food and sleep and the sensitivity of hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, and tasting. Thank you for the wisdom shared today from our presenters. Send us the gift of your spirit to guide us as we enter into this weaving. May all we see and touch, hear and taste give you glory. May we celebrate our humanness with joy in Jesus' name. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.